wrap up a series that we've been uh, on called He Shall Be Called. Uh, we're going to wrap that up today as soon as I get my notes organized here. A um, couple announcements as we jump in. First of all, uh, last Sunday when y'all were here, uh, and if you weren't here, let me catch everybody up. Uh, last Sunday, we made the announcement that the owner of this property that we are leasing with the option to purchase later in 2018 um, uh, had uh, given us an email, a proposal about possibly purchasing the property before the beginning of the year. Well, that was last Wednesday. How in the world, if you ever bought a home or something like that, how in the world do you close in just a matter of a few days? Well, I'm happy to announce that God's Christmas gift to us is no longer a wish or good thinking or uh, praying necessarily, prayerful thought. As of December 29th, all closing docs have been recorded. And Connor Church, Merry Christmas. We now own the property. Amen? <laughs> Woo! Praise the Lord. That's just, that's just another miracle and a long line of miracles that God has been doing on our behalf you know, he's been doing miracles among us, and we are so thankful, so thankful and humbled by it, right? Humbled by it. Well, we're going to be wrapping up uh, this series today, He Shall Be Called. Many of you have already written on our wall underneath the Encounter Church banner. If you've not yet, make sure you take time today to write down the name of God. In other words, how has God been acting towards you? And what name describes that, you know? Uh, today, we're going to be talking about El God, Derek, the way. Derek, D-E-H-R-E-K, the way. Jesus says, I am the way. Has he been the way for you in 2017? Jehovah Jireh, God, my provider. Has he, has he provided for you in 2017? Uh, Jehovah Rapha, my healer. There's, there's all kinds of, we have kind of a list on the wall there for you to choose from if, if you need help there. So make sure that you don't leave this morning without having written on the wall, you know, how God has uh, acted towards you in 2017. Uh, before we jump into uh, our final part of the series, He Shall Be Called the Way, I um, want to just prime the pump. Next Sunday, we're going to jump into a new series called, Called. Okay, that's going to be the name of it, Called. And why? Because each one of us are called to a specific plan that God has uniquely for your life. And it's gonna be so exciting to be able to unpack over the next uh, weeks what God might have in store for you in 2018. Just to give you a glimpse of what all that might be in over the series. So join us, don't miss a week of it. Uh, starting next Sunday, bring your friends, let's pack the house and uh, let's go through and say, God, what do you have for me personally in 2018? What are you calling me to in 2018, amen? Well, Let's uh, jump into this weekend's message. There was a young couple who were about ready to get married, sort of, kind of like Jacob and Becky last night. How many of y'all were at that celebration last night? What a party, huh? Well, man, when people came up to pray over them during their wedding ceremony, wasn't that powerful? Whew! And then, all oh, the party and celebration we had afterwards. Uh, so a young couple, sort of, kind of like Jacob and Becky, but, but also very different than Jacob and Becky, okay? And they were about ready to get married, and the young man went to his dad and said, you know, Dad, I'm a bit apprehensive about getting married. I'm, I'm a bit hesitant. And the dad said, well, well why, son? Why, why would you be hesitant? This is the girl of your dreams, man. You've been praying for this young lady. And he says, well, well Dad, you know, because I've got terribly smelly feet. It's gonna be so embarrassing when, when my wife finds out. Well, the dad, like dads do, they reply, well, man, son, don't worry about it. It's going to be okay. Just be sure that when you go to bed that you wear your socks. Put your socks on every night before you go to bed. And the son thought about that. He said, you know what, dad? You're right. You're right. The way that you're telling me to do this, your way, dad, seems to be fine. It seems to be right. And so I'll be okay. I'll just do that. Every night before I go to bed, I'll just put my socks on. So she'll never know. Well, he didn't know about it. But meanwhile, the young lady, his bride-to-be, went to her mother and told her, told her, Mom, Mom, I'm a bit worried and anxious about getting married. I'm a bit hesitant because I've got terribly bad, awful breath in the mornings. And, and, and I'll be, it'll be so embarrassing when my husband finds this out. And her mom comforted her just as only moms 
can. She said, now, honey, honey, sweetie, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Listen, listen, all you need to do, all you need to do is, is just to, before you wake up, go straight to the bathroom, brush your teeth. Don't say a word yet. Don't say anything. And you get to the bathroom, brush your teeth, and then you can talk to your husband. And everything will be just fine. Don't worry about it. And so the, the young lady thought about it. And she saw, you know what, mom? I'm going to do things your way. And I think, I think you're right. It's going to be fine. And, and so I'm just going to keep my mouth closed first thing in the morning until I make it to the bathroom and brush my teeth. Well, the day of the wedding came and went. And after about six months into marriage, they each managed to keep their secrets safe. Their parents' way of doing things seemed to be working just fine. Then one morning, about 5 a.m., the young husband awoke and suddenly realized that one of his socks had come off in bed that night. He, he frantically dove underneath the covers and began rummaging underneath the bed sheets there trying to find this elusively smelly, stinky sock. When he bumped into his wife and woke her up, as he popped his head out underneath those, those blankets, underneath the covers, she said to him, what on earth are you doing? And he replied, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, you, you've eaten one of my socks. <laughs> there is a way that seems right. The parents' way seemed right to them. But in the end, it didn't end very well, did it? There is a way. The Bible says in Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that appears or seems to be right. But in the end, it leads to death. You know, there is a way of doing things that seems right for a while. But in the end, it leads to the death of a relationship. There is a way that seems right for a while of doing things. But in the end, it leads to the death of your financial future. There's a way that appears to be right, at least for a little while. But in the end, it leads to the death of the spiritual well-being of your children. There is a way that seems right for a while, but in the end, it leads to the death of your marriage. Church, do you hear me this morning? Am I telling you the truth? Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 It's right, isn't it? Young people, it's right. There is a way that appears to be right. It seems to be right, but at least for a little while, but in the end, it leads to death of all kinds of things. But here, I'm here to tell you this morning that there is another way. Amen? Amen. Praise God. There is another way. Jesus said that I am the way. That's another name. He shall be called the way. El Derek, the way. That's our Jesus. And let me tell you this. Jesus says, I am the way. And his way, the Jesus way, always always without fail, every time without fail, always leads to life. Can you just tap your neighbor on the shoulder and say, his way leads to life. Tell him that. His way, every time without fail, leads to life. He is El Derek. Now, he is called the way. Well, the way of what? The way of what? Well, one of the reasons why we're gonna jump into the new series next Sunday called Called, is because we want to talk about the way of commitment, the way of blessing, the Jesus way. You know, you know why? One of the big reasons why we're here in this facility and, and why now the church actually owns the property is because of the commitment and the sacrifice of God's people here. Your commitment and your sacrifice that's one of the big reasons, not the only one, but one of the big reasons that we are all here. But I want to tell you that although this is something we can tangibly see and feel and enjoy, there's not a week that has gone by in the last several months, honestly, since we talked about Psalm 66, verse 12, and God's promise to his church, but not just to the church corporately, but those of you that have committed that have sacrificed. There's not been a week that's gone by that, that a family hasn't pulled me aside and said, Pastor Ed, I just want to tell you, 
God has done this in our family. We've been praying for this for years, and God has done this. Psalm 66, 12, that God would take our church into a season of blessing. He has promised abundance over the long course of time. He's given us a promise. You know, there was just a family that we were with a week ago, and they've been praying about six, seven years, six or seven years saying, God, God, would you, would you just restore these things? Every time they'd get together with family, it'd be like a huge cloud just cast over them. And there was no breakthrough. It was just always so awkward because of what had happened in the past. <laughs> this last week, they came to me and said, you'll never guess what happened at Christmas. God restored everything. It was like it had never happened. Oh, the relationships were powerful. And they shared that with us. We about started weeping with them because we've been praying for them with, for years. There's not a week that goes by that those who are committed, those who have sacrificed, have not been experiencing the promise and the blessings of God, those here at Encounter Church. And so this way, it's a way of commitment. It's a way of calling. It's a way of sacrifice. But oh my word, it is a way of blessings. We'll be talking a little bit about that. So don't miss a week. Don't miss a week. Today we're going to talk about Jesus being the way, the El Derek. But the way of what? Well, him being the way affects every facet of your life and mine. But we're going to pick just a few of them and enjoy the blessings of God this morning as we celebrate the close of one chapter of our life in 2017 and, and the birthing, the rebirthing for some into 2018. He is the way of what? The way of truth. The way of truth. Now, in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 14, the Bible says that the word, meaning Jesus, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the apostle John says. Now what he means by that is he and a few other of his apostles, the, of, his, of Jesus' disciples, literally had seen Jesus' glory. You see, they were with him on the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus was before them in his earthly form. But his earthly form transitioned was adapted to, is the actual language, to what is going to be. And so they saw the full blazing glory of Jesus Christ in a form that would not cause them to die, okay? It was his glorified being. And they, they had a glimpse of what, so when he says that we have seen his glory, they literally had seen the, the glorified eternal Christ no longer so much veiled by his flesh, but he, he revealed some of his flesh so that they could see the glory of his godhood. And so what he means there, they actually saw him. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son. There was no mistake about it. Who came from the Father, and, and church help me, full of what? Two things, full of what? Grace and truth. Full. What does that mean? That means that Jesus is overflowing nonstop for all of eternity with grace and truth. Jesus gives grace and truth. Jesus is the embodiment of grace and truth, truth in grace. So the way of truth, now what kind of truth? Now me personally, I believe in absolute truth. You, you may not be there at this time and that's okay, um, but I personally believe that this is referring to absolute truth. You know, gravity is gravity. If you jump off a cliff, it's gonna be splat, right, right? There are certain scientific absolutes in our universe, and I believe truth is one of them. There are certain absolute relational truths. There are certain absolute relational truths, and I personally believe uh, that if you, you know, cuss out your, your uh, date night after night after night, they're not gonna be your date much longer. Is, is that, can, you, can we agree upon that, you think? You know, if you punch them and you, and you hit them and you kick them and stuff, uh, you know, that's the relational truth about it is they're not going to stay with you. Okay, I, I could go on. There's relational financial truth. You know, if, if, you, if you do certain things, you, you're, you're going to wind up with certain results, right? If you go max out 20 credit cards, <laughs> there's consequences, Right? Right? That's the financial truth. And see, there's absolute truth in every facet of life. Why? Because truth comes from an absolute God. There, there are boundaries. There are things that he sets up. So I personally believe in absolute truth. You may not be there, and that's okay. Not a problem, okay? Uh, there's truth in relationships. There's, there's truth in love, for example. 
You, you, you tell me, hey, Ed, man, I, I really, really love my kids. I, man, I, I love my kids. Johnny, Mary, I love you with all my heart. I'd say, phenomenal, man, high five, boom. But, but the next day, I stop by your house, and there's Johnny and Mary playing out in the middle of the street. And you're in watching TV, have no clue where they're at. Cars whizzing by and thinking, okay. Well, the absolute fact of the matter, because there's absolute truth in my, in my view, is that that's dangerous. That's dangerous, right? Uh, you may say you love them, but actions are not showing it so much, right? And so you see, what happens is when you remove absolute truth from love, it no longer is love. It is now enablement, enablement. And being permissive to the extreme, now there's always permissiveness because there's grace with our raising kids, right? Always. Man, I'm, praise the Lord, God, my parents had grace with me. Oh my word, I wouldn't be here today. I'd be six foot under if they didn't. But permissiveness does not lead to life. And see, we're talking about the way, the way, the way of truth leads to life. Fullness, abundance, the way of truth. And permissiveness to the extreme doesn't. It, need, it leads to enablement. And a, enablement is not love. Enablement is unhealthy. It's harmful. And so as a parent, we, we, we have to say, well, there's some amount of truth here that I have to have some kind of boundaries. There's gotta be some kind of truth for there to be consequences, right? And, and so you see, Jesus is the way of truth. The Jesus way is the way of truth in relationships and parenting and, and finances and every facet of your life uh, is, is truth when we're talking about the way of Jesus. Not only is Jesus' way the way of truth, but he's also the way of grace, the way of grace. And we don't always like truth because sometimes truth can rub us the wrong way. But, but when truth rubs us the wrong way, it just may be that somebody loves you enough to tell you the truth rather than enabling you by not telling you the truth. Does that make sense? As a parent of, of seven kids, I, mean, I deal with this all the time, all the time. God's no different. God loves you. God loves you enough that he's not going to enable you. He's going to tell you a truth that you can handle to help grow you and mature you so you can be more and more whole, more and more healthy, so that you can help others to be whole and healthy, so that you can sustain relationships, and you can have the most fulfilling Life that you can, you can have life his way because you know there is a way that seems right for a while at least, but in the end it's death, diminishment of what God has in store for us. So there's this way of grace. You know this verse in John chapter one, verse 14, it goes on to say this. It says, the word, meaning Jesus, the Logos, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Uh, what that means is he tabernacled. He pitched his tent, his earthly flesh among us. He took up flesh. Uh, it's actually the word carne where we get chili with meat. It's God with meat. God with flesh is the language there. Uh, he says, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father. Full of what? Church, full of grace and what else? And truth. Now watch this in verse 16. It says, for from his fullness, this fullness of grace and truth, we have all received grace upon grace, and literally what that means in language is grace upon grace upon grace upon grace upon grace upon grace upon grace, it never ending. It never runs out. It's always overflowing out of the life of Christ. Literally, it means grace replaced with grace, replaced, replaced, replaced with grace, if I can say it, replaced with grace, replaced with grace, replaced with, replaced with grace, <laughs> in infinitum, forever. That's what it means, and that comes from the Jesus way, because the Jesus way is the way of truth, the Jesus way is the way of grace. In fact, in Ephesians chapter two, it says, for it is by grace you have been saved. The word sozo means reconnected with God, restored into relationship with God. By grace you have been saved through faith, through this ability to believe, to have heard enough that it stirs your, your spirit to believe but this faith is not from yourselves, it's a gift from God. So the faith that it takes to believe is a gift from God. Isn't that good? What a great, some of you all may receive that gift this brand new year. Wouldn't that be awesome? It's not by works so that no one can boast. It's by grace through faith, not our works. And to clarify it, Romans chapter 11 verse six says this. 
And if by grace, if our salvation, our restoration with God, our reconnection with God is by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were grace, if it were, grace would no longer be grace. So the Jesus way is a way of grace. I like that. Don't you like that? Now listen, the way of religion is not a way of grace. The, the, way, the way of trying to do better is not the way of grace. It's not the Jesus way. Ch- checking off the, the, the bullet points of, of everything you gotta get done to be pleasing to God, to have favor with God, that, that's, that's not the Jesus way of grace. You can't check enough things off. You just can't. You can't do it. You, you, you can't climb the ladder and, and achieve by your works a better attitude, a better lifestyle. You can't achieve the favor of God by that. It's not by your works. It's only by God's grace poured out upon you in what Jesus did on the cross and through his gift of faith to believe him. It, it's the Jesus way is a way of grace. Not only is it a way of truth and a way of grace, but the Jesus way is a way of forgiveness. It's a way of forgiveness. Now, forgiveness from what, you might ask? Well, it's forgiveness from falling short. Falling short from God's standard. You see, we all fall short. The, the, the definition of sin in the Bible is hamartia, and it means to miss the mark, to fall short of the mark. And so, forgiveness for falling short. The Bible goes on to say, for all have fallen short. That word for sin means fallen short. And fall short of the glory of God. Now, the glory of God, that word's doxa. It means the standard of God. What's the standard of God? It is his being. It is his character. It is who he is. The glory of God is the perfection of God. It is, you know, in the book of Revelation and throughout the Old Testament, anytime there's an appearance by the glorified Christ... His glory is such that it is described as a blaze of glory, a brilliant whiteness. In other words, it's so, it, he, he is so pure that he cannot be any more pure. He is so perfect that he cannot be any more perfect. And so therefore, we can't be in as full-on present as our earthly bodies because we'll die. That's why Moses had to be hid in, behind the rock, the cleft of the rock, or he'd be consumed by the blazing glory of God, the, the, the brilliance of, of, of the blaze of, of the fire of God. And that fire is not of anger or rage. It's not what it's described as. It's his person. It's who he is in his essence. He is just righteousness in its purest form. And we aren't. Jesus Christ has never fallen short of anything. He has completed all that was given to him to complete and he sat down at the right hand of the Father forever. He has never fallen short. He is God of gods, Lord of lords, and King of kings. And oh, that's good news for us because his perfection, his complete purity is applied to our life and it covers us. And when God the Father sees us in Christ, he sees pure perfection Because the life of Christ cloaks us. It cloaks our imperfection always. That's what it means to step into relationship with Jesus Christ. But but the Jesus way is a way of forgiveness. Let me say it this way. When I I grew up, I I grew up, a wonderful, wonderful uh, way to grow up was uh, Catholic faith. And uh, Father John Vogler and Gary Gebline and and Father John Ronquist, dear men, dear men who love the Lord a lot, and I'd spend time with them there at St. David's Catholic Church and, and learn a lot from them. But, but as I got older, I started taking and reading the Bible on my own. And I came across passages, uh, and then I studied the languages, Greek and Hebrew and everything like that, and I thought, wow. Man, I thought, I thought just praying and asking forgiveness was pretty good, you know, that, that I could ask God for forgiveness and he would forgive me. And I thought, you know, the next day when I do something wrong, I can ask for forgiveness again and God's gonna forgive me again. That's good, and that's good, but it's much better than that. The life that Christ gives you as a Christ follower is way beyond that. You see, 
When you step in the relationship with Jesus Christ, you are forgiven totally, completely, the Bible teaches. Past, present, and future in its totality. There is nothing left for you to be forgiven of. It is a positional forgiveness. You are placed in Christ positionally. And the Father looks at you and for eternity, he views you now as perfect. As pure as his son is. Woo! That's good. That's good, isn't it? So, you, you don't, I don't ask for forgiveness to gain forgiveness anymore. I learned that when I was about 19 years old when I started language studies. I, I learned that the, the Bible kind of forgiveness, the Jesus way of forgiveness, is total, complete. So, so I still ask for forgiveness, but it's not to gain forgiveness because I already have every, everything, all, all the forgiveness I will ever need. I already have it. I possess it in Christ. But huh, I do ask for, I confess my shortcomings and ask for forgiveness. Not to gain it. I already have it. Oh, this is good. But to allow God, the Holy Spirit, to wash over me again a fresh experience of that which I already have. You know, in the old days, I used to say, you know, I have my library in my office, and I have all these books on all my shelves, and now I have to say, well, I got my Kindle on my phone, <laughs> right? But I have my library, and every book that I've downloaded in my Kindle is mine. It has my, my name on it. If you went to Amazon, it'd be my account. You know, or if you want to think, of, you know, the paper on the shelves, all my books in my library, they're mine. They have my name in them. I own every one of them. But you know, there's, there's some books that I really love. Man, it's great, great books. And, and some of them I haven't read for two, three, four years. And oh, the thrill, the thrill of pulling that book back off the shelf, flipping through the pages to get to that one special chapter and, and just to read that chapter again. And, and let that chapter just wash over my life and experience it afresh again. That, that, that's why we ask for forgiveness. That's, that's why we confess our shortcomings. Not to gain forgiveness again. We already have total forgiveness because that's the Jesus way. That's awesome. But so that I can experience it afresh. So I can experience it afresh. You know, talking about forgiveness, there's, there is no truly healthy relationship that's possible without forgiveness. You cannot have a truly healthy whole full relationship, intimate relationship, without forgiveness being part of that relationship. What is forgiveness? Well, forgiveness is the act of releasing to Christ, releasing to Jesus, and that's important. I'm not releasing it to my brother or my mom or my dad or my spouse. I'm releasing that person or that offense to Jesus Christ. Okay? It's the act of releasing to Christ any person who has offended you. And not only releasing, but refusing to bring it up again or hold it against them. That's what God says. God says that his forgiveness is so complete that he has thrown all of our shortcomings as far as the east is from the west. Now, some of you that study geography, how far is the east is from the west? It's infinitum, right? It's infinite. It cannot be measured. The Bible also says that God took all of our shortcomings to, to those that are in Christ, who've, who've stepped into that relationship with Jesus Christ, he has taken all of our shortcomings and he's placed them in the deepest oceans and he remembers them no more. That's the Jesus way of forgiveness. You, you see, Jesus is truth. He's the embodiment of truth. I, I personally believe absolute truth. And therefore, he... He has to, there's gotta be consequences of our actions. Some, some really, really good and, and, and some bad. Because, because our relationships have to be based on some semblance of truth. And so when God forgives us and he says it's complete in his word, it's based on his truth. It's based on his character, who he is. The book of Hebrews has some impossibilities that God has placed upon himself. He tells us, for it is impossible for him to lie. Did you know God tells us it's impossible for him to lie? It, it, is, it is a perversion of his character. He would no longer be God. 
So listen, God's not lying to you. He is telling you the truth. You can be completely, totally, forever forgiven of all your shortcomings. Mm. And you still may want to confess and ask forgiveness for your shortcomings so you can experience God just washing over you fresh, but the Jesus way is total, complete forgiveness. So truth, grace, the way of forgiveness. What, what, we talked about what forgiveness is. What is forgiveness? What, what is it not? Forgiveness is not denial. You know, somebody offended me and I'm just gonna deny it. Or I offended somebody else and they approached me and I'm just gonna deny that it ever happened. No, no, that wasn't me. I'm gonna blame somebody else. But that's not forgiveness. And forgiveness is not excusing someone's behavior. Excusing someone's behavior is enablement and it's hurtful. So it's not excusing well someone's behavior. It's not forgetting about it either. Although refocusing on other things helps us to forget, forgiveness is not the same as forgetting. And forgiveness is not escaping consequences. It's not, God, I'm gonna ask your forgiveness or I'm gonna ask this person's forgiveness just so I can escape the consequences. Listen, even though you're totally, completely forgiven if you're a Christ follower, I'm totally, completely forgiven if I'm a Christ follower. If, if, I, if I don't stay following the Jesus way, he is the way that leads to life, there, there, there is a way that appears, at least for a while, to be right, but in its end, it's death. And so, forgiveness, escaping the consequences, and it's not permission for future abuse. Forgiveness is not. I, I, will you forgive me then another time of abuse? Forgive me another time of abuse. No, get out of that situation. Forgiveness is not an excuse for future abuse or permission. You know, as believers in Christ, we are commanded to be the initiators of forgiveness when an offense happens. That's, that's God, God wants that, why? because he wants us to be able to release people so that we don't hold ourselves in prison. Do you see that? God wants you to forgive, and as a believer, uh, he wants us to imitate his forgiveness to us. And so we're to forgive people when they offend us so that we don't wind up holding ourselves in a self-contained prison. He wants to, to be free to experience his grace, never to have shame, because we're totally, completely forgiven. So believers are commanded to be initiators of forgiveness, but sadly, we, we must understand that not everyone will be forgiving to us. Not everyone's going to forgive you. And you just try to do your best to seek their forgiveness, and if they, they're unwilling, then, then that, that's your best, and, and you, you've stepped up, and, and you just you, you, you go down the road, and you just keep following the Lord. And God may bring that around in 10 years, in 10 months, in 10 days, 20, 30 years. He may bring that back around. He's, he's done that many times in my life. I offended someone I didn't even know I offended. You know, or sometimes I offended someone, they wrote me a letter to make sure I knew. <laughs> Two months later, 20 years later, I run into that person. It happened to me in Kansas City about three years ago. Two people coming out of the door that wasn't wide enough for me to get around the door, you know what I'm saying? I had to go right through them to get into place. And I walked in and I had asked forgiveness from this couple many times and they refused to give it. And I came in that door, years had gone by and I tried again and they wept and they said, we love you, we have forgiven you, we want you to know that. What a, they went to Kansas City, I wasn't even why I went, but wow, God was waiting for me there. Forgiveness. So let me ask you this question. When's the last time you've practiced forgiveness in your relationship? Maybe in your marriage even. What a way to start Jesus' way in 2018, a clean slate. Wouldn't it be awesome to start 2018 with a clean slate? Forgiveness, the Jesus way. Maybe, maybe today sometime you need to pull your spouse aside and say, you know what happened back at the beginning of 2017 or even 2013 or just last week? I just want to ask your forgiveness. Will you forgive me? I'm so sorry. And experience that washing, that cleansing that, that, that you will receive from that person. What, what a way to start 2018. Total clean slate. Forgiveness, Jesus' way. The Jesus way is the way of forgiveness. So the, the Jesus way is the way of truth. It's the way of grace. It's the way of forgiveness. It's the way of life. Jesus says in John eleven twenty five, 25, I am the resurrection 
that's a mouthful right there. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life, as if there could be more than just the resurrection. <laughs> I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. My dad died a couple years ago, but yet he is living after he has died. Physically, he is still alive. In fact, he is more alive now than I can even imagine. He is alive. I remember when we used to do a four-person golf scramble. It's kind of a simple format. That format, if you're a golfer, is much like the pro-am tournaments. Each team has one pro and a few amateurs, four people in total. And then the low score from each of the amateurs is then recorded. And, and in other words, even on the holes where three out of the four on the team do horrible, if one of the four does well, well, then everyone on the team does well. So the pro on our team was always my dad. It was always my dad. You know, I, I know it wasn't anything like the Pro-Am tour, but the way the scores kept was identical as how they would do it. So let's take a typical hole where I come up and I, and I get my driver and I hit the driver into the fair lane if it hits the fair lane. <laughs> and it may take me eight shots before I actually hit the cup. And so my score is eight strokes of the golf club. It took me eight. And if you know golf, you know that's pretty horrible. <laughs> you know, I've had 20 strokes before and that was really bad, but just say eight for argument's sake makes me look a little good, so anyway. And, and then my brother, who always would play as well, he, he may get a five, because Joe was, which was always a better golfer than I was, and uh, then my dad. And we'd always have a friend that would play, and the friend may get a five or 12 or 20, depending on who went with us. But my dad step up, he'd drive that ball, and you go, where'd it go? And you walk down the fair lane, and it may be shanked a little bit, but it's typically in the fair lane. And he may have gotten a three. And that was just great, you know? So my eight then is forgotten. And my teammates, three is remembered. The pros, three is remembered. You know, a person could get used to this, don't you think? You see, I get credit for the good work of someone else simply by virtue of being on his team. And therefore, I get the credit for it, just by being on his team. Listen, Christ has done the same for you. He has. Well, what my team did for me during the four-person golf scrambles, God does for each and every one of you who are following him every day of your life. Because of his performance, you close your daily round with a perfect score. And it doesn't matter if you sprayed a few into the woods or shanked one even into the water. Listen, watch, watch. What, what matters is that you showed up to play and that you joined the right team. That's all that matters. That you showed up to play and that you joined the right team. You, you see, as a Christ follower, the spiritual foursome you have is unbelievable. It's just strong. It's you, the Father, the Son, Help me out, church. Who else? The Holy Spirit. I'd say that's a pretty good foursome, wouldn't you? You got a pretty good team day in and day out. That team's gonna hit a perfect score and you'll get the credit every day. There's not a better team that exists. But the thief, the devil, comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, John 10.10 10 says. But it goes on to say, Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. You see, the Jesus way is a way of life. Jesus is the way, and his way always, always, without fail, every time leads to life and life abundant. And the last way, and there's so many, because when you follow Jesus and you follow his way of doing things, it affects every facet of your life. So these are just a few. One last one. The Jesus way is the way of trust. You know, to define trust is to place somebody or something in the care of another person. You entrust them, something or somebody, in their care. It's to place your faith or your confidence in somebody's character, their qualities. Let me ask you this. Have you placed your life into God's care? Have you, have you placed your life into God's hands? Have you come to the point yet in your life where you have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ with your eternal destiny? Oh, I pray that you discover that. 
that today you would take at least one more step closer to investigating the evidences and the claims of Jesus Christ. That's my prayer. You know, I remember a time when my brother-in-law Gary placed his log splitter into my care. I love that old log splitter. Why would he be willing to place his log splitter into my care? Well, he had confidence in the character of Jesus Christ in my life. And therefore, he trusted me with the well-being of his log splitter. Well, after running through the first pile of wood, and I'd put that log on there, and it crash, boom, bang, bong, and it spit out split wood. I unscrewed the gas tank because it died, and I thought, it must be out of gas. And as I unscrewed the gas tank cap and, and filled it to the rim with unleaded fuel, I was surprised, kind of that it just wouldn't let me pour a whole lot of gas in there. It got full pretty quick, so I put that gas tank cap back on there. And then after screwing the cap back on, I proceeded to try to pull start the log splitter. And it wouldn't start. In fact, it sounded like it was just simply dry firing. And it just didn't make sense in light of how well it ran during the first pile of wood. Now. So I began troubleshooting, but you'd have to understand Gary's log splitter to really understand my dilemma. See, this was a homemade log splitter. Ran really well, except for the uh, chicken wire and the cargo straps that all held it together. So I had to be careful with any troubleshooting that was to be done. After hunting around, looking at it, investigating, I noticed a second gas tank. And I thought, well, Gary doesn't take his log splitter and drive it beyond the state line, so why would he need two gas tanks on it? And so I went ahead and filled that second gas tank all the way up, and I was getting ready to start it, and I thought, you know what? I'm puzzled by this. Two gas tanks just doesn't make sense. So I called Gary to ask him about the situation. And, of course, he said, well, you know what? The first tank that you filled up, Ed... That was the hydraulic fluid tank. Thank you. Somebody understands what that means. But because of our relationship, our trust, Gary knew that he could trust me to act according to my character in regard to his log splitter. So I called him before I ran it with gas mixed with hydraulic fluid. Okay? Listen, you can trust God. You can can trust, even though you don't, you might not know much about God yet, you can trust God to act according to his character when it comes, when it comes time to trusting him with your life. You can trust God to act according to God's character when it comes time to trust him with your life. Let's all stand. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Lord God, we thank you that you can be trusted. We love you. God, I pray that this morning, if someone has not trusted you with their life, their eternal destiny, that today would be the day that we'd be able to rejoice with them stepping into a relationship with you. May you receive the glory and honor and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.